If you were to look up rock star in the dictionary, his likeness and image is a perfect fit. As perfect as any could get. Swagger meets ability in an artist whose resume includes running bands like Age of Electric, Static and Stereo, Sin City Sinners, Slash's Band, but more recently, Todd Dammit and the Anti-Stars. Welcome, Todd Kearns. Oh my gosh. I mean, how am I going to follow that up? <laughs> it's, been, it's been a long time. It has been way too long. Yeah. Talk about, if you would, the project you're most connected with and excited about for fall 2016. Well, this has been an amazing year for me because it's the first time in a long time because I've been doing Slash's band for six years, which has been like, you know, an amazing experience, uh, you know, just around the globe, you know, time and again. And then like, you get spit out the other end of it. And then someone says, well, what do you want to do now? You know, and you kind of have to really say to yourself, you have to have, you know, some, a moment where you're like, I'm not sure. I, I'd like to sit on my couch and watch my TV and sleep in my bed for a minute. And then, um, I mean, the Annie Stars came around from basically, when you end up with a catalog of stuff, like you were just mentioning, all that stuff, you go, well, I want to play my music, but I, you know, I live in, in Vegas now, and I live in the States, and I, you know, commute between Los Angeles and there all the time. So it's, it's been a really interesting thing for me to be able to kind of almost reboot my life at the... Uh, 10 years ago, in a sense, just being able to go down there and be like, and no one's, hey, it's Todd Kearns. Like, no one knew who that was. So it was kind of like, you know, that's where the name Todd Dammit comes from in a funny way, because it just turned into a, it was an old nickname that just sort of, just, you know, kind of hung on, and then we just sort of had fun with it. And until the Slash gig came along and opened up an entire world, like, you know, it's like, you know, now there's like Facebook pages of Todd Kearns Budapest and Todd Kearns, you know, my friends make fun of Todd Kearns Zimbabwe, Todd Kearns, you know, Kazakhstan, you know. But it's, you know, it's really created a whole other world of this kind of stuff. So for me in, in 2016, putting out a solo album again, you know, which is all, you know, to me, I've really kind of dug into this whole crowdfunding and this whole kind of new world, of new way of doing things, which to me has been really freeing um, to do what you want to do and not have to kind of get stuck in the wheels of the machine. And then uh, now with the Annie Stars and, and, and all that, it's, I can do whatever I want, really, is what I try to do. So... Even coming here tonight, being in Ontario has been sort of like doing an acoustic show. The acoustic thing for me is is an ongoing passion of mine that I just, you know, if you just throw me in a you know, if you hand me a guitar here, we probably would have a good time. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. What's the best thing about playing acoustically as opposed to being loud? Well, music? I think that it really, the, the, the best thing about it, and, and the scariest thing about it, because I remember the first time I ever did it, Kevin from the Grapes of Wrath in, in uh, Vancouver said, hey man, we're doing this acoustic thing, and a bunch of guys are going to come out and play, and I was like, sounds great, I'll do it. And then it wasn't until after I hung up the phone that I was like, wait a second, I've never done this before. This is like, you know, 20 years ago or something like that. So I really had this moment of like, oh wow, to, to imagine kind of getting on stage without those loud amplifiers, without the drums, and all the things that, that cover up any sort of imperfection. Not to even mention the idea of you don't have the deflection of three or four other guys to just kind of like to go to. Because I always see stand-up comedy sounds terrifying. I go see stand-ups all the time and I'm always taken aback by how, you know, you're just up there with a microphone and you're, if you, if you suck, you suck. You know, it's like, there's no like, you know, the drum, that was the drummer's fault or that was the guitar player's fault. Because there's always that joke that whenever there's a mistake, always look at the bass player and, and make a wince like, you know, so it's just kind of like to deflect the... Uh, when you're by yourself, there's no safety net. There's and, no... and momentum's a, a, a scary thing. When it's good, it's great. When it's it's great. going the other way. That's exactly it. Like when you're bombing, you're bombing. And it's kind of hard to get out of that, that, that tailspin, you know. What's Las Vegas like for you as a musician who's a Canadian, and why did you go there? It's a bizarre thing because, uh, again, it was not really a, a plan. You know, I just sort of like... Um, uh, I had a couple of offers of different projects to work with down there. I was recording bands at the time, so... I went down there and I, I just sort of like a lot of Canadians are there. That's the other bizarre thing about it is it's like when I'm in the DMV line standing there to re you know to, to get my license redone, as I look around and there's a Canadian passport for every second person there. It's fascinating. But I mean Cirque du Soleil, Celine Dion's band, uh, all that kind of stuff. I mean there's seven Cirque du Soleil shows in town, so it's like there's a lot of Canadians employed. I think most of them are Canadians anyway. Um, and then. Uh, I just, you know, it just became one of those things where it's like, I don't live here, I just work here, I don't live here, I just work here, uh, I'm, I'm living here half time, I'm living here half time, to I live here. It was, it was the strangest sort of turn of events. I was already buying a house before the Slash gig even came up, because 
because of course the, the housing market in, in the US at that time was so low, especially in places like Vegas, that I, um, you know, that I kind of like, okay, fine, I'll put my stuff here. I live here. I live in Las Vegas, Nevada. But um, I always enjoyed it and I always really like it. It's, it's, there's a, a huge entertainment community there because of what it is. Um, and if you're someone like me who's just been in music and doesn't know a whole lot of other stuff, it's sort of perfect for me. We live in uh, a very sort of like suburban corner of the city, so it feels like sometimes we're in uh, Humboldt, Saskatchewan sometimes. <laughs> and then we can go like five minutes over here and it's just, you know, the end of the world going on on the Vegas Strip. So I kind of like that dichotomy of like I can have my quiet and I can have my... Absolutely, the exact opposite. I'm guessing that the lack of snow is a great thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the exact opposite thing, though, because in you know in Canada, at least the Canada that I grew up in, you stayed indoors at this particular point in the year. Now you stay indoors in summertime in Vegas because it's you know it's the surface of Mars over there. Yeah. And it's just crazy. Yeah. It's all a shout out to Agent Royale who not only surprised me at my book signing of Banter the Horseshoe and Toronto back in June. They also touted you as someone I need to talk to on the uh, Records and Rockstars podcast. And your connection to them is clothing. Tell us Absolutely. a bit about the brand. Well, it's funny because um, I met the gang just in passing. And they've sort of all, in, in a funny way, have always sort of been in our orbit with the, sl the Slash camp. And uh, we always loved their work and uh, wore their work. And then we just slowly, a million years ago, I wore this t-shirt a friend made for me. It just said, damn it. Todd Dammit was the, was the gag. And I wore it on a DVD that we made with Slash when we played in Stoke on Trent in his, you know, place of birth. He technically was born in London, but he grew up for a brief period in this area of England called Stoke on Trent. So we made this DVD there. And I wore this t-shirt and all it said was Dammit. Real, like, you know, somewhere in a corner of a mall, somewhere made kind of shirt. And I started getting all these hits, like, hey, can I buy one of those shirts? Like, oh, there's only one. I'm currently wearing it or whatever. And we just sort of slowly kind of started selling them out on, on our website and just kind of, you know, just very sort of like, I don't know, grassrootsy punk rock out of the back of a van kind of thing, which is always the way I think of things anyway. And then these guys came along and they started, uh, they just made their own Dammit shirt that had a, a it looks like a Bat Dammit kind of, we call it the Bat Dammit, even though it looks more like Satan, but uh, <laughs> yeah. they gave me one. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's great. And it sort of took off, and I, I, again, I wore that one shirt that they made me, and everybody was going, where do I get that shirt now? And I go, well, I'm wearing the one shirt. So we sort of talked to them and, and said, why don't we partner up? Because you guys know what you're doing, making, because the, the big difference is it's quality stuff, the organic material, the, the whole, that kind of stuff side of it, we really kind of didn't put a whole lot of thought into. We were just putting, you know, like, because you see all those $5 t-shirts or whatever, $10 t-shirts that just say Nirvana or whatever you can get that'll last a week, you know, so um, we thought, It'd be great to have the quality level and then having people who know what the hell they're doing, which is a big part of it too. So so it's been an amazing partnership. I mean we've got you know, we've gone from t shirts into like now we have toques. I still call it a toque. I refuse to change it to beanie. But <laughs> <laughs> it's still a toque. It's still a toque, yeah. And then we have like uh, you know, like everything, leggings and scarves and, and, and jackets are coming and it's it's sort of really building into a a lot more than I had ever foreseen, frankly. I just thought it was, because I'm the same way. It's kind of like, I'm, I play in a band, we make t-shirts, we sell them, we get them out there. This is something else, so. Merch extraordinaire. Where does someone get these t-shirts and this sweater? Agent, agentroyale.com. I guess that's just a standard. Is that the yeah. actual, yeah. Oh, and, and you just go there and you can find the damn it wear on there. They have their own stuff as well. It's really killer, which we all wear that too. Slash has tons of stuff. Johnny Depp wore one of the shirts recently on a, at, a, at a Hollywood Vampires show so it's it's all really great quality stuff and really rock and roll stuff too johnny Depp as a musician <laughs> riff uh you know dude your 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 sort of view of that i have my one johnny Depp story which is really funny because i i um it, it goes back to everything else but I, I was at a rehearsal i went to a rehearsal to go meet up with duff mckagan we're dropping names here watch your feet so <laughs> i'll get you a basket <laughs> yeah but I had to go see Duff McKagan about something else. And he's like a friend, of course, through Slash and all that kind of stuff, which is already bizarre enough for me to talk about, like what a fan I was of that stuff. And then suddenly be going, I gotta go see Duff. And he goes, just come by rehearsal. Okay, cool. So I go there and I go, oh damn, it's like Matt Sorum's there. And I realize, oh, this is a Hollywood Vampires rehearsal. I didn't know what I was getting into. Alice Cooper walks over. I'm like, oh my God, you know, like, I'm already freaking out. I've, I've had the good fortune of playing with Alice on a number of occasions. He's an amazing man. Um, you know, and you're like, wow, this is like next level. And then Depp walks in and you're like, and you realize how bizarrely like out of sync this whole thing is because 
there's something like, like Alice is Alice. I mean, to me, he's like, you know, he's the, the cock of the walk. And then when Depp walks in, you're like, you know, it's a bizarre, okay, weird. But he was in this, in this really cool place where he's like, I'm playing music with some with some cool people. That's really cool, you know. Um, anyway, and he comes over and he introduces himself, and we had this minute of like, oh my god, you know, kind of like, hey, dude, no. and then, and Black Mass was just coming out, and I said, do you have to shave your head for that movie? And he goes, no, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, they did a thing, like a, whatever they do, but he says for the um, for Fear and Loathing, they shaved his head, and he told this funny story about how and this is the funniest thing about it. He's just like as personable as like you know, he's just happy to be like hanging out in this rock and roll environment. And uh, he just told me the story of how he shaved his head, you know, in the Captain Picard kind of way that it was shaved. And he said he was so accustomed to going out with sunglasses, hoodie, kind of hiding himself to go do stuff because he's Johnny Depp. And somebody said, why are you bothering? It's like, you're bald. No one's going to recognize you. No one's seen the movie yet. Just go out. So he apparently went out with like, just put his sunglasses on, went out, walked around. It was in Vegas because uh, I guess they filmed a lot of it there. And uh, he said that no one recognized me. He said the only thing that would happen was other bald guys would give him this kind of like nod. Like he was part of the bald guy club. There's the bald <laughs> yeah. guy nod. There's the beard nod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the long haired nod. We used to have that back in the mall when I was a kid. You know, you'd be like long haired, hippie metal looking guys, and you'd see the other guy and kind of nod at him. Ooh, you're one of the few that's held on to his long hair. With I let go of it. It came back. You know, it's. We just went through this whole period in the last. Well, I, in the Slash band, we joined, and, and me and a couple of guys in the band were just kind of like. Well, the one guitar player has the beard, so we just kind of like just let everything kind of go. But it's a, you know, uh, it's a funny thing because you, you, I, I have so many friends that are way more plugged into the things that kind of like refuse to kind of be a part of it anymore. <laughs> it's kind of pulled out like, ah, the hell with it. What's something about Slash that uh, you can share with us that the average person who is a fan might not know? You know, it's, it's really interesting for me because I think I went into it with a lot more of this kind of like, rock and roll animal kind of thing about him like i think that you know this jack daniels wielding kind of like you know that kind of thing and he's actually like the most intelligent guy that i one of the most intelligent people i know really he just reads these big thick books and and he can hang on subjects that you don't expect him to hang on like especially things like reptiles and dinosaurs and things like that he's really into that but um he's a really intelligent guy but he's also a really intensely hard working guy like he's always got a guitar in his hands he's always pushing himself People say to me all the time, like, I think he's playing better than he ever played. And I go, I 100% agree. He's like one of those guys that's just, he's really, not that he's not satisfied with where he's at, but I think he feels like there's always somewhere else to go. So he'll be like, he'll be like, uh, you know, come up with some weird, uh, you know, kind of like progression that he never played before. And then he'll suddenly come up with songs like Anastasia from the Apocalyptic Love album, which has this kind of like bizarrely kind of uh, neoclassical kind of moments that he would never have kind of even indulged, but because he finds these new little, little elements he just kind of adds to the thing. Todd Kearns is here. He's a, he's a rock star and always has been. <laughs> and he's on the Records and Rockstars podcast. I'm Jeff Woods. Of the 60s and 70s bands, if you had to narrow it down to two or three, who do you most revere from that period? Um, that's a really tough one, but I think that, you know, I mean, the 60s and 70s is really the mother load of, of music for me. And I think that there's always that Beatles and Stones conversation. Um, uh, which is tough, but I think Beatles, Stones, Who, Kinks, um, you gotta you gotta give it up for Zeppelin, and you gotta get into like things like in the seventies. I get more into things like um, Cheap Trick is a big one. Mm -hmm. Kiss, I have to give it to because I was the perfect age to be a, a Kiss fan, and it's remained in me as some sort of like virus that never goes away. Um, the Aerosmith, ACDC, it goes on and on and on. For me, it's, it's but I, I'm especially like when I look at my when I look back now, I always go back to the sort of Ramones. Iggy Pop, MC5, the sort of, I just imagine, I once in a while hear these things and I take, have to take myself back to when that would have, like, if this was, like, that year, that day it came out and I pressed play, it must have been, like, the end of the world just happened, you know? Because I'm trying to put it in perspective of what was going on and just go, you know, you press play. Same with, if, I can't imagine hearing Black Sabbath for the first time or something like that in 1969 or whatever year that would have been. It would have scared us at any age. Absolutely, yeah. It scared me. I mean, I know, I, just the other day, a whole lot of love came on the radio and I'm one of those guys, I've been jamming in bands my whole life. And I, you know, after a while you just get so tired of playing a whole lot of love in a jam session, you're like, really? Okay, here we go. But whenever I hear the original stuff, I'll turn it up and I go, I go, I remember that, I, I just distinctly remember putting that record on the vinyl, putting the needle on and just being like, it was somewhere like, it was both terrifying and, and really sexual and like all those kind of things all at once. And I think that are really hard for teenage boys to really kind of 
put into words or even understand. But I think that that's, and I think that's a pretty good example of what rock and roll is supposed to be to me. But despite the often cited assertion, in every decade, really, that rock is somehow dead, we both know that it is, but it's definitely tougher to find on traditional radio in 2016. Sure. Uh, finding competition from a lot of bands that appear to have abandoned electric guitars, not for keyboards like they did in the 80s. No. Uh, but as Joe Walsh put it, they're cranking out music on virtual instruments and drum machines without the magic that we all know and love in the old records, which had a lot to do with a band playing in a room together. Sure. Now, of course, there was multi-tracking with no way additional tracks, but at the core of it, oftentimes, three, four musicians got into a room and played it live. Did you hear Joe Walsh on live at Daryl's house, Daryl Hall, mm -hmm. talking about the state of the music industry? Have you seen that clip? Yeah, oh yeah, it's fantastic. You know it. What's your reaction to that sort of uh, uh, viewpoint that Joe Walsh shares with so many of us, and, and your take on music today? That's a hard one in general, I think, because, I mean, mostly it's, you know, like, I, I find all of us kind of can't help but sounding like old men if we start to think about, like, just the, not that long ago I had somebody complaining to me about, I don't know if it was a Run DMC or Public Enemy being, uh, you know, put into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame like they weren't a rock and roll band. I go, dude, you've never sounded older than you sound right now. Because we were already feeling the change of the guard years ago. Like, I remember it took us so long after the Age of Electric split up to get this Static and Stereo record out that, you know, I put my heart and my soul and blood and sweat and tears into and to release it into a world that was already um, feeling the crunch of downloading, all that kind of stuff that was already starting to occur, to the point that in an industry like Canada, it you know, it was crippling for us because it was like, well, it meant that our bread and butter was officially kind of like being pulled out from under us. Um, and I, you know, but again, it's like, you know, when someone says to me, you know, once in a while I get bands turned on to me, like, you should check out this band, or you should check out this, or you should check out this and that. And it's been like that as long as I can remember. And even as a kid, when people said, you know, like people say now, they'll go like, well, there's no good rock and roll music on the radio. And I go, dude, you have to seek it out because we sought it out. You did not find Iggy Pop on the radio. You did not find Ramones on the radio. You found it. And, and then maybe things like, there was certainly things that, that crossed over. But we, not that long ago, I was watching this, this compilation of like Old Grey Whistle Test or, or one of those like kind of music shows. And it was like a 70s thing where it was like a lot of Seals and Croft, a lot of sweater vests, a lot of, you know, like, and I was like, because this would have been what the mainstream radio world would have been. So we would have been, I would not have been a part of that. No, I'm not mad at Seals and Cross. It just wasn't my trip. I would have been like seeking out all the music I just mentioned. So I think that that still exists today. It's going to, you know, no matter what. Mainstream pop radio has always been not my tempo. So I think I, I have always sought out. When you talk about Canada, there was in the 90s, we really had a moment there where there was a lot going on. A lot of Canadian bands were signed. A lot of us got on mainstream uh, rock radio and um, hip hop has become the new rock and roll in terms of like the dangerousness the the, the, the edgy stuff I mean it's kind of like that's kind of where it's at and some of it is so great and when you look it's at Tom Morello teaming up with, with Chuck D and doing Prophets of Rage yeah, that's that nice. works it's a culmination of a lot of great influences absolutely and a lot of success yeah I, I'm with you when someone says there's no good rock or rock is dead or there's no good music today, I do say that it lives and breathes and sweats on the stages of many, many clubs and there's records being produced as we speak. And there's the kids in garages and basements somewhere that we're going to hear about and go, damn, have you heard this? I think it's, it gets harder and harder when someone says, have you heard this? It's it's really cutting edge and it's really new. And because there's you guys like you and I have so much wealth of, of what we've heard and listened to and been a part of, that we can't help but reference everything that comes out anyway and go, well, they're not really doing anything new. I heard Duran Duran do that, or I heard, you know, whoever did that. So it's kind of really hard to, I hear things like the Ant Word out of South Africa, this hip hop group that's completely like, it really is like nothing I've ever heard before. So once in a while I hear something like that and go, that's unique. Of course it's, it's hip hop and it's got elements of dance and things like that. So it's coming not necessarily from a completely new place, but it's, I've never heard anything like it. And, you know, I think that, you know, when the, when the White Stripes came out, or that whole movement of, of the Black Keys and a lot of those kind of groups that were kind of more into a blues-based thing, bizarrely, but still had an element of garage in there, they created a whole new element of things, too, that I think that, I think a lot of kids picked up guitars. I see teenage kids now who play better guitar now than we did at their age. You know what I mean? Like, they're just kind of like, because their parents like rock and roll. When I was a kid, 
it was not a cool thing. I mean, it wasn't like a, a, your parents were encouraging you to be in a band. My parents were 100% not cool with it. Like, it was kind of like, they were okay with you playing, like, you know, I don't know, like a, a family get-together play, you know, you know, roll out the barrels or some kind of, you know, party songs or fun songs, but then they would assume you would get a job or an education and move on with your life. There was no intention yes. of you picking up a guitar and throwing everything else away to play rock and roll. Yeah, have fun on the weekend, Todd, but become a dentist. <laughs> <laughs> Still working on that. <laughs> um, Todd Kearns is here. A couple more questions before I let you go. I know you've got some incredibly packed days and press in the show in Toronto. Uh, let me ask you this. If you had to pick one commonality, a strong common thread among the best and most successful musicians, what would it be? Oof. Well, I think, you know, the, the, even the term best musicians is, is such a, a, a giant palette in and of itself. Super subjective. It, because I, mean, I think a lot of the time, you know, and I've said this before, there's a lot of musicians that um, that may not actually be sort of virtuoso, virtuoso guitar players or musicians or whatever, that sometimes have a whole other element. Because Bob Dylan, we can have this conversation all day long. I have friends that, I don't get it. I do not get why that guy. And I go, and I'm like, as a lyricist and all the things that go along with that, it's like, of course I understand it, you know. Um, but I think that, I think a lot of it is just, uh, there's a certain amount of magic there that's kind of almost, you can't put a, put a finger on what actually, you know, makes someone special. And then there's a lot of hard work and a lot of craziness that really, you know, cause every once in a while I have to question, you know, the, the, the reason I still do it, you know, in terms of like, there's, you know, cause there's always ups, there's always downs. What the matter? If I was a postman, I mean, life would be like that. It'd be like, it was a good year, it was a bad year, whatever, you know? But, um, but, but there's no retirement goal and plan. There's no, you know, but I mean, my retirement plan is, I look at B.B. King or I look at Willie Nelson and I go, that sounds good to me. You know, I'll be playing somewhere. As long you as know? I have a voice and the ability to, to form a chord, I can continue to play. You can, yeah, and that's really all that matters to me. I think it's all that mattered to me when I was 11, 12, 13, 14. It's all that matters to me now. That's probably all that'll matter in 20 years from now, if I'm still around, God bless. <laughs> But I don't know what actually would unify any of those sort of like all these musicians that I consider fantastic or great. Because I'm, you know, I love the New York Dolls. And I go, but, but they weren't musicians in terms of like, it would be hard to go, okay, well, was Johnny Thunders Jimmy Page? No, not, not, even, not really. But there was something, un, I always love the idea of the chemistry when you put four or five guys, sometimes three guys together in a room. Because you could take those same guys, put them with another couple of musicians and, and sort of mix and match. And they all create different cross-pollinations of interesting music, but, but there, every once in a while, like a band like the New York Dolls or, or, or any number of groups we can mention, those guys did something amazing together, you know, that, that in a lot of ways doesn't really exist other than those five people being in that same room together. So to me, it's it's really, I like to hold on to the, 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 the magic of it. Like, I don't think that there's necessarily anything you can really put your finger on, because there are, there are, I've known a million great musicians who who fell by the wayside in terms of, you know, anybody, anybody has to be crazy to go, hey, let's hop in a van and drive from Vancouver to the, the, the nearest city is like Calgary or whatever. And, you know, we're not going to make any money. And, you know, and, and we, may, we may not even be able to put gas in the, in the vehicle, but we're going to hop and we're going to go all the way up to Winnipeg and back and, and play music. And, you know, if you've got five guys, one of them is going to be like, I have a job. I have responsibilities. I have a mortgage. I have a car payment. And you lose that guy immediately because he's going to be a real civilian, normal person. And the rest of us are just dregs of society that are going to, you know, just going to do this. And you have to find your other dregs and kind of decide that this is what we're going to do with our lives. And it's not really about money because I'm still getting ahead of the car a minute ago about how, like, you're always battling the idea of, like, is it, it's not really about money. It's about, I love doing this. So it's kind of like you fall ass backwards into being able to continue to do it, but it's kind of like... Um, you do it because you love it. You really do it. It's, and I have friends that are straight up addicted to music. You know, it's kind of like you're not going to do anything else. And they really aren't. <laughs> you really don't want them to be in charge of anything else. So, you know, you wouldn't want them to be responsible for anything. You're not going to have them driving the forklift because God knows they'll just vanish. And, like, you know, oh, sorry, man. I'm, but, um, I'm thrilled that you've uh, stuck with it. And that's really a big part of it. Stick to it. This or whatever you want to position that is because you love it. You can continue to do it as long as you're healthy. And I'm glad you're still you mentioned acoustic is a, is a, is a, a really negative way to, to play and because you have no sort of uh, net to catch mm -hmm. you. Um, would you rather hold a bass or a guitar in your heart? In my heart. Stage? 
Yeah, that's a funny one because people always ask me that. Because I, I, when I first started playing in bands, I played bass, and people always say it's weird seeing you playing a bass. And then I'll get people going, it's weird seeing you holding a guitar. Because now I'm, I'm known in two different factions, but it's kind of like um, I think that on my own, I have to say guitar because you know, if you give me a guitar, I can entertain you. If you probably give me a bass by myself, I can entertain you too. But I think that you know, as you know, being in and of itself, when you really boil it all down, I think it goes back to being a singer and a songwriter and a musician. Um, Playing guitar is, 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 for me, I've always said that you give a kid a guitar, he can take over the world. You really can, you know. Um, now you can give a kid a computer, he can take over the world, or, you know, or, or, or a turntable, I suppose. But it's, um, um, it's the same language. I mean, it's the same way to try and connect him with people with music. For me, you know, playing bass with Slash has been, has been an amazing, uh, you know, being a part of a, of a gang, that mentality. Because the bass guitar is, is and I've always sort of used this, you're playing with the drummer because you get in the group. You're playing with the musicians because you have musical notes to play. Kind of, did you like the way I used drummer and then musician? Sorry, guys. <laughs> but I meant like drummer, you've got that groove thing. Guitar players, you've got this kind of like, you've got to kind of lock into the musical aspect. And you're trying not to, the bass is always interesting too, because you try not to do exactly what the guitar is doing. You're trying to kind of accompany. And I have a lot of guitar player friends who pick up bass guitars, and it's a bit, they're not quite in the groove. They're not quite... They're playing it as a guitar, and it's not meant to be. So it, I love the challenge of it, and that's why things like acoustic guitar, bass guitar. I'd love to play drums in a punk band someday. I'm a terrible drummer, but I'd love to do it. Acting, you know, whatever. I've had a lot of weird things thrown at me, and I've always gone like, that sounds terrifying. I'm way out of my wheelhouse. Okay, let's do it. You know, I think that's part of the... Uh, Part of the, it goes back to the craziness of why I do this in the first place. It's incredibly easy to see you in, 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 in any number of acting roles, in my estimation. I would love to see you do some, sometimes. Yeah, you never know. Well, I, I did back in the 90s when I, was, when I was in Vancouver. It was so prominent. It was around me all the time. All my friends were filmmakers. And, hey, we need a guy with black hair and tattoos. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the musician type? Okay, I could do that. Say your few lines and then off you go. I think I'd be much better at it now because I think I have a better... Uh, respect for it in a sense because I think at the time I was my own boss and I don't think I was very good at kind of falling in and going I got to do what this guy says now oh okay but I always you know, but I'm such a film buff I'm such a, 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 a TV nerd um, we're really in a renaissance these days it seems like but um, uh, that I, that I think I really, would really be much better at it now because of my level of appreciation for it today more than ever in my estimation rock documentaries are right. either at, at, at their pinnacle with no sort of sign of slowing down. They just keep on coming. You mentioned Alice Cooper. They're super good for Alice Cooper. Mm -hmm. uh, another one, Superman ship of the story. Of yeah, Gordon, that's managed right. Alice Cooper and so many more. You've seen those. Is there, is there a, a rock documentary you've recently seen or that really stands out as a must-see for these? Oh, there's so many. You know, which one I just recently watched was uh, I Am Thor, it's called. I haven't seen that one. Uh, it's the, the, the musician Thor from Toronto. Yeah. He had a, you know, kind of keep the dogs away and all those kind of songs. It's, it's, it's kind of like the Anvil one. I don't know if you ever saw the Anvil one, but it has those elements of like, I'm always fascinated by the guys who have, um, you know, it seems like they, you know, they're not the most natural of musicians necessarily, but just the drive. And I think that's a big part of what we, uh, I might have missed in the earlier thing is that drive, man. Because I think that's true in almost all forms of, of business or all forms of art. Because there's a lot of guys out there who kind of like, <laughs> like on that Ed Wood movie. I was always fascinated with Ed Wood, the character, too, but when they made that movie and there's that whole thing of and, you know, Johnny Depp's on the phone going, worst movie you ever saw? Well, my next one will be better. You know, and the whole idea of, like, you know, you just never falling by one person's opinion telling you you're terrible, you will never amount to anything, and you go, and there's a, there's a certain amount, there's a certain percentage of people who just go, I, I suck, I'm terrible, I'm, I'm getting out of this. And then there's other people who just take that and they put that into their tank of gas and it propels them to next levels, you know. And I've seen it happen every step of the way. So the I Am Thor one has elements of that where he's sort of knocked down and keeps going. And I'm like, good for him, you know. I, I, looked, uh, I, I looked at my wife at one point going like, I don't know if you should let me keep going if I get to this point. <laughs> you, know, you know, the whole idea of like showing up at Sweden Rock, the festival, and like by yourself to fly in to play with the, some sort of like pickup band and you've got a you know a, a suitcase full of like you know rubber skull costumes and things that he wore and it's just fascinating to watch but but it really ends up being really inspiring because you're kind of like man if, if, if he can do this then why can't I you know and I think that goes all the way down the line and Ed Wood is another perfect example of that but um, a lot of those kind of films are, are to me are really great because 
it's one thing to watch, like, uh, I remember reading Rod Stewart's book. I'm, 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 not only am I a huge uh, music documentary fan, but I pretty much read every music book that comes out. Same. So, But the fascinating thing is that usually in any rock book, even like Motley Cruz or whoever has these sort of ups and downs and, and you know, and this happened, and then, you know, they went to jail, and I lost some money. You know, Ronnie Wood's book has elements of that. Um, but Rod's was like, you know, I'm Rod Stewart. I grow up. I you know, get into music, and I'm Rod Stewart, you know, at the end. It goes on for like 40 years of him being Rod Stewart. There's not really elements, I mean, other than like a couple of divorces, which I don't think really slows him down at all. Um, I think that, you know, that there was one divorce that really kind of messed with him, but, but I mean, it's really fascinating to watch that happen, that, you know, you know, you just kind of fall into being a rock star on stage, being Rod Stewart for the rest of my life. <laughs> Where in other elements, and, and I think most of the inspiring stories are the ones that have these sort of ups and downs and waves of because it gives it a human quality. Because you know, I've been doing this long enough that, that my heroes have all become people. You know, in a, in a funny way. As much as I still am, you know, can't help but be, you know, put them in a place of. Because it seemed like the Beatles fell from the sky as a child. They were just kind of like, you know, they were just like, and, and you couldn't even aspire to be that. And I, I didn't. You know, I, I looked at the Beatles and I looked at Kiss as a child. I just sort of thought, well, Kiss are a bunch of superheroes or something, and the Beatles are from like heaven or something. I don't even know what that is. But when I saw like bands like the Who. I remember seeing the Kids Roll Right movie was the one that really took me. Actually, the Kids Roll Right is a fantastic one, though. Even though it's not necessarily a bio, um, it really inspired me. Because I, I just looked at these four misfit-type people, and I thought, well, I can do this. You know, in a, you know, in not taking into account that Pete Townsend is probably one of the greatest writers of all time. But it was a working band. It was something more than so gnarly. George Thorogood talked to me, and I really liked his sense of uh, this... He said the Beatles were that on the table. Thing. Yeah, but the Stones. Yeah, yeah. sort of an idea that maybe we can do this. <laughs> but for, of course, at my age, the Stones were were still up on that mountain. Right? It was like a whole other level because the Stones, the Stones are like holy ground for me. I don't. And I just had a conversation the other day about how no one gives Mick Jagger the props as a lyricist that he deserves. We always talk about the Stones because it's the Stones. You know what I mean? It's like to me, like Jumpin' Jack Flash. For whatever reason, I have lyrics on my tattooed on me because it's the first. Rock and roll song. I remember hearing that one. I went, "Whoa, what is that?" It's like glan and glan and glan and glan and that opening chorus is like really took me to a whole other place, you know. And I really think it probably is one of those things that weaves its way into your system and starts this pattern of rock and roll for the rest of your life. I agree. But I mean, you can sit down and want, you know analyze lyrics like "Sympathy for the Devil" or or you can analyze what you want, and and I think that you know that guy deserves a lot of props. They're on par with Dylan. And I think so. I think there's certainly. I think that Dylan, in, in a sense, could have pushed everybody into. I mean, John Lennon and all those guys kind of went, "Damn, okay, this guy's taking it up a notch. Here we go." You know? And they had to kind of dig a little deeper. Have to ask you this: the risk of putting you on the spot because people are talking about it still, and people want to know when uh, Brian Johnson was replaced by Axl Rose. What were your impressions of that right out of the gate? Didn't it sound completely insane at first? Like, it really did. That and was and like, yet it was successful. It's fantastic, actually. It, it, it just sounded like one of those crazy things of like, you know, like taking peanut butter and chocolate and putting it together. It sounded like taking salsa and like, you know, and like a pudding. And you were like, really? I, but at the same time, you, you, you know, objectively have to take a step back and go, I've seen Axel, you know, do ACDC songs in the past. They, they would do a whole lot of Rosie. They would do all those kind of songs. And, um, and I know he's a massive fan. So he, I know he would show up with a, a great deal of respect for what it is. I just saw them not long before Brian left. And I went in really sort of like um, with a certain amount of like detached snobbery to the fact that uh, Phil Rudd wasn't playing drums, uh, Malcolm Young wasn't there. So I kind of went in going like, well, let's go see what it's like. And I got my ass kicked. Like I seriously walked in there. I was like, damn, dude, these guys are not playing. They're not, no joke. And, and it was a real deal. Like I was like, I was taken aback. And Brian had, he had such a great like, like he's the master of ceremonies at, at like a at a I don't know like a like a an Irish pub or something. He's got, he just feel like yeah he just kind of has that. He's funny. He's, he's great. So to lose him, I was like, oh, that's a heartbreaker. You know, I just I think that that's really kind of in a funny way takes the heart and soul out of it. But if you're gonna do it and you're gonna carry on, and I'm assuming it's there's some business stuff in place that we don't necessarily know why that this is still occurring, but. Uh, I think that Axel's, I mean, everybody its everybody can attest to the fact that watching it on YouTube, you go and he's singing the hell out of that stuff. And I think that that's, that's really what it comes down to. The Axel Rose is, is a great rock vocalist. And he's a great character. I understand that putting him in place puts puts very curious people in, in seats, you know what I mean? I can see that it 
was a success. Uh, as are you, as you always have been, as I hope you always will be, Todd Kearns, I'm really pleased to have had you on the Records and Architects podcast. We invite you back anytime with a new project, whatever you want to do. We'll anytime talk about music. Age of Electric is supposed to be coming here someday, so you never know. The, the, one of the coolest sets of <laughs> brothers bands that's ever been. Let me tell you a little story before we go. Okay. Uh, early National Bear on the radio station. We were playing a lot of new rock. We were increasingly playing new rock. We started sort of as a heritage classic rock, and then we realized there's so much good music. How can we deny it? Well, so uh, the EP came in, Age of Electric, and uh, I took two songs. I suspect it would have been Untitled and Ugly yeah. into the music meeting. And the program director at the radio station is the gatekeeper, right? I was just the music director then. And I said, you really need to hear these two songs. And he was the kind of program director that that I admire him for. He would really make you make a case for oh, really? a song before he would agree to play it on the radio. And invariably, we play three, four, five new things after each music meeting on the radio. He goes, so tell me more about this band. So I explain two sets of brothers. They're, they're, they're hardworking. They have passion. They're really incredible live. And he goes, well, I'll tell you what. You really want, which one do you want to play? And I, and I, and I, I couldn't decide which one. He goes, we'll play them both. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Apparently, my argument worked. Wow. Apparently, he dug you it up. So and he owed you a great deal of props. Then. Well, right. we, we certainly uh, played the hell out of the edge of and so uh, more shows are welcome. Well, it's a bit of a bizarre thing because honestly, it's like, you know, it split up in 1998, like as my my young nephew calls it, the 1900s. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it's bizarre to them, right? What? The 1900s? But um, I go, uh, you know, it's been like 1998. And the weird thing about it is like any band that splits up, I suppose any relationship that splits up has a weird period of like, you don't really... And we kind of always kept in touch because we were always basically family, you know, even though there's two sets of brothers, it was always kind of, we grew up together in a sense. And, um, you know, over the years, we just kind of like found ourselves back in each other's orbit and doing stuff. And Ryan and I were already kind of working on songs probably 10 years before we ever even decided to get back together. Even though, even though getting back together was putting too fine a point on it because it sort of just it was not even that much of a discussion. Um, we just sort of, uh, you know, uh, just got phone calls from, uh, from uh, promoters, you know, I would get these regular phone calls and I just one day decided, you know, the, 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 the calls were getting so, not, not the calls, the offers were getting so good that I was like, well, we probably should have a conversation about this. And the next thing we knew, we were like, you know, okay, let's do it. 17 years later, you know, <laughs> bizarre as that seems. Again, come back, see us anytime soon. Love to. Best Todd Kearns, 